Revelation chapter 6. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, a noise of thunder. One of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every freeman, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? We begin talking about the fifth seal here, as we've already covered the first four. In Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9, it says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. And I alluded it to a little bit in the previous week, because sometimes I like to read ahead. And I noticed that as things began to ramp up, as the seals started to open, you saw that, that things just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And the fact is that you find here the people that are being slain, the people that being are persecuted, the people that are being tried with fire, as it were, are the ones that have the word of God and have the testimony. The Bible says in Proverbs, it says, The beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water. And it's interesting to note that as the seal comes off, almost the same thing is happening here. It's being released like water. And that's when the strife and contention starts, but it ramps up due to the wicked hearts of man, due to our, our contempt one for another. And too often one's flesh gets behind a thing, it just, it just snowballs into the scenario that we have here. We found uh, last week in discussing these things that the first seal, someone came conquering. The second seal, we find that peace is removed. Then we find the plagues of, of famine that come upon people. And next thing you know, death and hell are coming and people are just fighting one with another. And it keeps ramping up to the point of the fifth seal where what they're talking about now is a great persecution, a great slaughter of the saints. And it says of these saints that they were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. That means they are slain because of the word of God and the testimony which they held. Now what is the word of God referring to here? Well I thought maybe it was because they had the word of God written and, and they were carrying a Bible with them perhaps or maybe they had it written in their hearts and they were quoting it often but what I believe actually is the case is that they're slain for the word of God is referring to the fact that they're slain because the Bible said so. Right? We love to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. We could also say, these 
were killed for the Bible tells me so. These were killed as they were because the Bible said it would happen. They're slain for the word of God because the statement was made in the word of God that it would be so. Jesus knew it would come and so he declares it and this is the purpose and the end plan that he actually had is that his will would that these people would be slain. And why do I say that? Well, look over in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 11. It points right at the end. It says, should be fulfilled. That statement, should be fulfilled. That is always referring to a statement made in the scriptures that is later come to fruition, that is later fulfilled, that is later uh, realized in its fullness. That's what he's referring to. So they were slain first and foremost for the word of God because that's what it said. Because of the word of God, these are slain. Also, because of the testimony which they had. And there's, this is what is referring to the actual statements being made, the, the preaching of it. The Bible says that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy, the literally living breath of prophecy that comes from us is the testimony that Jesus gives us. And that's what flows out of us. Because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If you have the spirit of Jesus, if you have the testimony of Jesus, you can't help but have this come out of you. It's going to spill out of you. Another part of our testimony, which we're all very familiar with, is our salvation, right? We go to people, and we quite often, as a gospel presentation, we'll tell people our testimony. Where we were when we got saved. Where we were when that salvation happened. Where, where we had been in times past. And now what we have done ever since. It becomes a story. It becomes the testimony of ourselves and how Jesus Christ impacted our lives. And the next part of the testimony that these have, which we have as well, is our service. So we have, first of all, the prophecy, the preaching. We have our testimony, which is, which is the salvation that we have and the story of that. We also have our service, so the works that we do, the actions that we do, because we have heard the word of God and because it has entered into us and has convinced us that, hey, some of the things I used to do were wicked and wrong, and now I behave differently. Glory to God, it's because he told me, thou shalt not, and I realized that, and I repented. I changed my mind about that sin after I got saved. And now I do things a little bit different. And that all encompasses the reason why they are being persecuted. The testimony that they have is the reason why they are being persecuted. First, because they're prophesying. They're preaching the words of God. Secondly, because they're telling of their salvation. And they're also showing their salvation through their service that they are doing. And so, as often is the case, whenever you live out your faith in public, there becomes some backlash. But here we are at a time in history, which is the future from where we stand today, a time in history where things are getting so bleak and awful and wicked in this world that just having the Word of God and the testimony in your heart and coming out of your mouth is enough to just drive people to utter contempt and hatred for you. We get a little taste of it each and every day when we go out and live our lives. But the reality is, is that this is a time being talked about here in Revelation where all of that will be escalated, where the persecution will just ramp up and ramp up and ramp up and things will get more and more difficult for those that have the testimony, those that are giving the testimony and preaching it. In verse 10, the Bible continues, and it says, And they cried, these are the souls that were under the altar. The souls that, I don't believe that they were literally under the thing, but rather, I think that they were actually perhaps before it. The altar was set up, and it was high and lifted up, you know, just because it was on these pedestals, not because there were stairs going up to it, but it was, it was taller than everybody, so to put the offering into this giant altar was quite difficult. So under it simply means that they were around it. They were, they were beneath this altar as far as... The uh, elevation goes. So these souls were under the altar up in heaven, and they were pleading for judgment. Verse 10 says, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So this is another thing that just points to the fact that these are Christians. These are believers that are being persecuted because now they're up in heaven. They're under the altar. They're praying to God saying, Lord, how long are you going to let this continue? How long are you going to wait before you judge these people for their, for their actions, for their persecution of us, for the suffering of the saints? They're pleading that vengeance would come. And up in heaven, it makes sense, right? When, when they're pleading for heavenly powers, when they're pleading for God Almighty to bring his vengeance down upon people, it makes sense because up there they have no means. There's no way of them crossing over and avenging themselves. 
But the reality is, is here on earth, we're in the same state where we don't have the same magnitude. Up there in heaven, they don't have the same means. And down on earth, the saints that are still alive don't have the same magnitude. So what we should do is the same thing that we will want to do one day in heaven. is We should just pray to God to take care of these things for us. Don't go take vengeance in your own hands. Don't go and try to fight back. Don't go and try to attack. Don't go and try to... Uh, to just to just destroy all of your enemies, you're, you're going to fall. They're, they're going to take you out because the Bible is promising that's going to be the case. But if we pray, the Lord will avenge us. The Lord will avenge us and take care of our enemies and take care of the distractions and take care of things that come at us in this way. And that's what the, the, the picture that you have here is that the same way in heaven is the same way we ought to act on earth and that we ought to have the right mentality when it comes to persecutions and that we ought to just realize that, yeah, you can go and take care of your enemies and maybe you can take down one, you know, hypothetically. But the reality is, is that God can take out entire armies with just one breath. We ought to leave this vengeance and this judgment into his hands. And in his hands, he will no doubt take care of such things. Verse 11 continues, and it says, And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants and also their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So here the word of God is proclaiming that there will be a fulfillment of this um, attack of this persecution of this of this great slaughter of the saints and it will be fulfilled when the full consumption is made essentially when your fellow servants and your brethren are finally killed this seal will be fulfilled and what this is showing us is that we're kind of ramping up to things, aren't we here? Uh, if you were just reading a, 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 a storybook, perhaps, and you're getting to a point where, where, um, where, let's say, the great hero is, you know, his friends are all dying off and things are uh, looking very bleak, and it's, it's, it's closing in to a point that we like to call the climax in literary devices, right? Something is coming to an end, right? And right before it, there's the, there's the great time of, of um, the most excitement, the most action, the most building up of, of things as they ramp up, and then we reach that point which we call the climax, and then usually the story unwinds itself, but it's only a little bit of a conclusion on our, our general story and how things break down. And it's interesting because a lot of those literary devices are just stolen directly from the Bible. Most men recognize, even authors, that the Bible is the best book that was ever conceived of. And, and so whether they attribute that to men or they attribute that to God, You'll find atheists and scholars alike that just say this is the best piece of literary literation that we have in, in the entire world. And so they'll often take different themes that are, take different, different uh, methods of, of portraying an idea from it. And so what we see though is that up in heaven they're resting a little season. Down on earth they are to testify unto blood. There's two different plans that are being given to all saints at this time. The ones in heaven get to rest. They get clothed in white. There's a finality to their journey, though they're still praying for their brethren down on this earth. And the ones that are down on the earth, do you know what they have to do? They have to just keep testifying. They just have to keep the word of God. They have, just have to keep holding on to what they have and proclaiming it, testifying even unto the blood, because that's when the finality of this all comes to be. So we see then that things are starting to reach that climax. As, as we built up and as we followed the opening of that seal, uh, things just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And you can see how the, the hatred has turned unto the saints of God, uh, unto God's believers, unto the Christians. And now it's getting to the point where there's many in heaven crying out, how long is this going to last for? And there's many on earth who are dwindling in numbers, getting down to the point where there's none left. And until there is none left, what the Bible says, that they should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. When that happens, then that seal is complete. We can see that there's a finality here. There's an end to a certain story. And that end is the time of brethren and fellow servants being upon earth. That's a clear distinction that's being made and being shown to us. But we know that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I think what's happening here is God is giving a little space of grace to the last few wicked 
unbelieving heathen that are left upon earth to hear the preaching of the word of God and to repent from what they're believing and trusting to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a little bit of space of grace still right up into the very end of time when the last few believers that have the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ are proclaiming the truth, are preaching the truth, even as they're being destroyed and killed one after another after another. God still is long-suffering to people that he would even have these believers there, but we also notice that God is also not just going to sit by while his people are being slain one after another after another. God has those in heaven and he's comforted them by giving them white robes and saying, just rest, just relax for a little season until your brethren suffer the same way you do. But I don't believe God to be one that just lets his people suffer in this way, though he is using them for the purpose of, I believe, just reaching others, reaching more people, preaching unto others. you got to think, maybe there was a million Christians at one point, now they're just being slain and slain and slain, and the less there are on earth, the more there are in heaven, the cries are just getting louder. God, how long? How long are you going to let this go on? And maybe they're even seeing upon earth, I don't even know how things might play out, but they know that there are brethren down there, they know that there are still people that they have not been reunited with in heaven, and they're just praying that God would end all of this as more and more come to heaven and more and more arrive telling the stories of how they were slain and how they were persecuted and how they were destroyed and God says just wait just wait there's more still preaching there's more still handling the testimony preaching giving the word of God you have to wait you have to wait and God is long suffering because he's not willing that any should perish and then it comes to the point and what the Bible is indicating in verse 11 is that that end of that seal is actually when all of them, the fulfillment of all of the brethren and all of the servants being destroyed is fulfilled. As you turn over, it says in Acts, or in, in verse 12, sorry, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. It seems like that, that change has made. It seems like God saying, wait, and rest has changed. Doesn't, doesn't it indicate that? You just went from one verse where God's like, just wait. These servants, these, these fellow servants, these brethren need to be killed. Just wait, just be patient. And then another seal opens. And immediately when this seal opens, there's a great earthquake. The sun becomes black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon becomes as blood. Keep your finger there in... Um, Revelation chapter 6, and go with me to Acts chapter 2. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts to chapter 2. And this statement regarding the moon being darkened and the sun being darkened is brought up many times in scriptures, and I often use this as as, uh, as kind of like a, a, a compass rose, kind of like the, the center point, the, 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 the thing that you look to to set the timings of everything that's going on in last day's scriptures. Acts chapter 2 and verse 16, I believe the apostle Peter saw it in the same way. Acts 2, 16, he says, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and all my servants and all my handmaidens will I pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. So whenever you see something from the Old Testament, especially in the prophets, Quite often, it applies directly to the context in which the prophet is speaking, but it also derives to a later context. We see this because Peter says, hey, this is what the prophet Joel was saying. But it also applies to Peter because he's saying this exact scenario is what is happening and what Joel was talking about. And so he brings the statements of a prophet of old into the context of modern day. And he says that this applies directly to us when he makes that statement. Hey, this is that. This is that. This is exactly what he was talking about. What you're seeing here is what he was talking about when he wrote this. In verse 18, it says that on my servants and on my handmaids will I pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall 
prophesy. Then it says, And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. And this is what I alluded to in the previous study on Revelation as being the great exploits of the believers. As they're being persecuted, as they're suffering tribulation, as the enemy is coming upon them and the whole world is seeking to destroy them, these exact things, I believe, are what comes to pass. There's going to be servants and handmaidens even having the Spirit of God to prophesy, to teach, to boldly proclaim the Word of God. They're also going to be given power, don't know what it is, but they'll be doing wonders and signs, and all of these things will be seen before men as a last effort for God to have people change their mind and believe in Him and trust Him and stop from their wickedness and trust Him in order that they can be saved from all their sins as a last ditch effort. And I'm not just pulling out a context that Joel talked about and then Peter drew into the present time, but I believe this was also pulled and talked about as something in the future. If you just turn the page, you can go to verse 20. It says, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Look what's happening. God is making it very plain with verse 21 that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved is the end goal and purpose to everything that's going on here. Right? The prophecy that's coming forth. The wonders that are coming forth. And then finally the great Portrayal, the great action in heaven where the sun is turned into darkness and the moon into blood. It's all to the end that men would call upon the Lord, that men would be saved. It's the only reason why God is giving the power to prophesy, the power of wonders, and then showing his power in heaven. It's that last bit of grace. It's that great big fulfillment of the statement that Jude made when he said, and some save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. You don't get any last minute in what's happening here. The last call, the last opportunity to be saved is being given to the world. God so loved the world, he gave his son. Here God so loves the world, at the very end of time that he's giving his servants, the prophets, as they're being slain one after another after another. And all they're saying is, believe Jesus, trust Jesus dead. Believe him. Trust the Lord and he shall save you dead. One after another just dropping and dropping and dropping and God's being so patient even as those in heaven are like Lord please intervene. Lord please help my brothers. Lord look at their suffering. Look at their look at their woe. Look at the dread. Look at what's happening to them. They're, they're, they're slain. They're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Because of the word of God he promised so and he lets them stay and suffer these things. He lets them be there in order that one more might believe on him and trust him. The Bible says all this comes to pass before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And if you were to go back to Revelation chapter 6 very quickly, the Bible says in Revelation 6 verse 17, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? That great day is come. The Bible says, finally, at the end of that chapter, finally, when that sixth seal has arrived, that same great day of the Lord that follows the sun and moon being darkened, that follows the stars falling from heaven, is revealed at this time. And God makes that statement through, I believe, the inspiration of the Holy Ghost upon even unbelievers when they're falling and hiding themselves under the dens and rocks of the earth, saying, fall on us, and they make the statement, the great day of his wrath is come. It's here. Who shall be able to stand? Keep your finger in Revelation 6, and we can go back to Joel. We can go back to Joel in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Joel is one of the minor prophets. You'll find, uh, you'll find Ezekiel, Daniel, those are very big ones. Hosea is a little bit bigger of a prophet. And right after Hosea, you'll find Joel. Right after Hosea, you'll find Joel. I could go to Joel chapter 2 and verse 28, but he basically quotes that exact statement the Apostle Peter does when he says, And it shall come to pass afterward, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And he talks about the prophecy that will come. He talks about the wonders that will come before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. That sun shall be darkened, that moon shall not give its light. And then he makes this statement across in uh, Joel chapter 3 and verse 14. He brings it up again. He says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. 
the sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. It continues on and says, The Lord shall utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So here again in that great valley, in that great time of decision, God is about ready to just shake the very heavens, to darken the sun, to darken the moon, to show himself strong on the behalf of those that have trusted in him, those that have believed in him, those very few that are left upon earth are going to be emboldened by him. His hope will come as he enters into the scene. And finally, the prayers of the saints come to fruition as he enters in and, and gives people again one more time. Multitudes of people and multitudes of people having life and death placed before them. And he says, choose ye life. Because I believe even then the prophets are preaching. Even then the people have this great hope within them that if they could just save one more, what glory it would be if they could just save one more and pull them out of the fire it would be worth it all the pain and suffering all of the loss all of the the things that they have seen and been through and God forbid but how often do we find in our lives when people just wait and wait and wait how many times have you heard I'll get saved another time I'll believe another day I've even seen people on their very deathbed saying saying there, there's more time I'll do that some other day I'll do that some other time and these these stories and you know when you look upon the people that there's just no hope there's no chance of another day call upon Jesus today it's it's one thing when you see a teenager saying I'll do it another time I'll do it another day but when you see people at the very end and this is exactly what you see here. God's saying there's multitudes here. There's so many here and they're in that valley of decision. They can choose life, but they're all choosing death. Choose life. Choose life. And in that last moment of grace, he still provides the miracles in heaven to show his power, to show his willingness to take those that would believe and take them to heaven when they die. And that's, I believe, the whole thing ramping up to this. The whole purpose of the great slaughter, the whole purpose of the miracles and the preaching that are happening is all that God would give grace one last time to those that are upon earth. If you go back to Revelation chapter 6, and you can also go to other passages in Ezekiel 32, Ecclesiastes 12, Isaiah 13, all of those refer to the sun and moon being darkened. And uh, those are all just, just prophetic iterations, a, a precursor to the, the time that we're talking about now. And you can go there and you can pick out other things about the sun and moon being darkened and find what's going on in the events of those days. Verse 13 of Revelation 6, it says, And the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Job made an interesting statement in, in chapter 9 of verse 7. He said, He is, referring to God, which commandeth the sun, and it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars. It's interesting because God's the one that sealed the stars and aren't we seeing an unsealing and an unsealing seven unsealings that are happening now seven seals that were upon this book that as they open whatever was concealed behind them whatever judgment from this earth whatever was being withheld at this time is now being released and now even in the sixth seal the stars are falling and it was God that sealed them up there in the first place he just has to open the seal and let them fall and that's what we see here Verse 14, it says, And the heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And we've heard that in that famous hymn, It is well with my soul. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so it is well with my soul. And what it's talking about there is it's connecting that verse in Thessalonians when it talks about the great trumpet sounding and those that are dead in Christ rising up. And he connects that also with this event where the clouds are being rolled back as a scroll. Spoiler alert, that's after the tribulation. The Bible is recording in verse 14 that the heaven is departed as it is rolled together as you bring it forth just everything is peeling back and at the same time mountains and islands are moved out of the place can you see that God is is changing his gears a little bit here he's, he's, he's allowed for these things to happen and most of them that we've seen to this point are completely man-centered they're completely just men being rotten one to another they're just acts of men's sinful flesh just being release just being poured out in in the vilest and most extreme ways 
But God says to his saints that are ultimately being destroyed during this time, just wait. And when they wait, he does that great sign in heaven at the conclusion of that fifth seal. The sun becomes dark. The moon becomes his blood. And now the stars are falling from heaven. The sky is starting to pull away. And it's, it seems like God, just in those few verses, has changed from, all right, I let you have grace. I let you have mercy. I gave you a space of grace. But now he's pulling away the sky. And as he does, mountains and islands are moved out of this place. At this time, it's, 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 it's coming to what we see in verse 4. Verse 17, the great day of his wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? Think about it. Who's going to stand when the island they're standing at is peeled out and put into the ocean, put out of his place? Who's going to stand when the mountains are falling, when those great heaps of stone are just crashing to the ground as God removes the skies and, and peels away the earth in his power and awesome glory. No one's going to be able to stand and there probably is going to be some people at this time trying to seek a soul winner, trying to find, what was that message? Where's that Bible? What is going on? There's going to be some that are seeking. There's going to be some that are wanting, but the Bible records that what was to happen at the end of the fifth seal was that all the saints would be gone. They would be destroyed. They would be killed. And so people are left with nothing, no hope. And so what do they do when they see these things come to pass? They try to save themselves. Isn't it so ironic that the ones that refuse salvation offered by God as a free gift are now trying to save themselves? In verse 15, the Bible says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every fleerman, hid themselves in the dens, in the rocks of the mountains. They're hiding themselves. They're trying to cover themselves from these mountains. And they're trying to, trying to just escape from... What it says in verse 16, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. See, you would think that these would come, and they would finally get it. They would finally see. God was right. The preacher was right. The prophet was right. That book was right. But instead, they're trying to save themselves. They continue to try to save themselves, hide themselves under the mountains that are falling, and plead that even those mountains would be more merciful to them than the God that's coming in his wrath to destroy them. Remember those saints that were standing up there saying, how long, how long, how long? Remember the pain and suffering and anguish that they went through, saying, how long, how long, how long? And now it turns. The Bible records in Isaiah chapter 34, it says, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. And this is what's happening is God in Isaiah chapter 34 prophesied that this would come. He said again that the, the, the clouds or the stars would be dissolved, the heavens would fall. And I was going to go there. You can write it down. Isaiah 34 verse 1 and verse to 5. But at the end of it all, he says, God's wrath is fulfilled. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. And that's exactly what happens in verse 17. It says, the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand. The statement of those hiding themselves, the rich men who had the money maybe, the, the, the means to, to get into this cave, the last bunker, those big bunkers that they're building all over the countryside in order to hide away when something bad happens. It's almost as if these rich men, these rulers, these kings and these princes know that something like this is coming to pass because they're building in the sides of the mountains of Colorado. They're building in the sides of the mountains of the Rockies. They're building in the sides of the mountains all over this world just for preparing for the time when they're going to have to hunker down and hide themselves from God Almighty. But they can't be hit if these mountains are going to be removed. They can't be hit if the islands are going to be moved out of their places. But what led to all this? What was the reasoning for all this happening? You can go to Revel or Matthew chapter 24. I'm just going to finish up there. Because I don't want to lose track of the fact that these things are connected. Matthew chapter 24. And in verse 21, the Bible says, For then... Matthew 24. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall ever be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days should be shortened. 
I believe that's what happened somewhere in there. Somewhere in that time frame when they, it was said that all of the servants, that all of the brethren would be destroyed. And then God starts to turn his tide. After that tribulation that came, that great tribulation such as has never been seen on this earth, those days were shortened and some flesh was saved. If you're to look down in Matthew 24 and verse 32, we don't need to worry about these things, right? We don't need to be scared. We don't need to be concerned. We don't need to fret these things. If you're counted worthy, it's a great honor to be one of those in the last days preaching the truth as, as the hand of man comes upon you to destroy you. As you're preaching and proclaiming to the lost, just, just repent and believe the gospel. Just trust Jesus. Just trust Jesus as they're trying to take your life, as they've taken your family members' life, as you've seen such great horrors come upon the believers on Christ. We don't need to fret these things, but what we can do is we can learn from these things. Matthew 24, verse 32, it says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put his forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, Know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. That's referring to the generation upon what these events happen to. Who's ever there when these things start coming to pass. Verse 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And this is what we're going to have to stand on. If you're blessed to be here in the last day, hey, you're going to have these words written in your heart. You're going you're gonna to remember, perhaps, back to the time when Brother Josh was talking about this. You're going to think to the th things, and as these things start to come to pass, they start to unwind, and you see the ramping up, and you see the hatred of the world coming down upon you, and you see Christians dying left and right, and you see that great persecution such as was never since the world began. And then you see that, that glorious removing of the heavens. You see that glorious and wonderful destruction of the earth beneath you. The Bible says, when you shall see these things, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Yes, heaven will pass away. Yes, earth will pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And these are the words that it was talking about back in the context of Revelation chapter 6 when it says they were slain for the word of God because of the word of God because God said it was so and that is the greatest thing that is going to be just just faith exploding from your hearts when you see these things coming to pass in real time and you're just like oh it's next what's next what's next what's next and these things are just encouraging you and strengthening you and you're getting out there and you're preaching and you're ministering and you're telling your testimony and you're you're pointing people to the Savior and it's just gonna be a wonderful time for believers to do great exploits we need not fear these things we only need to trust that the Word of God said it would be so and that is what gives us the glory and the power and the same thing that gives these Saints the wherewithal to stand up to these end times things is the same thing that's going to encourage us as we read them and see them come to pass.